Real life detective stories dominate headlines, movie marquees, and television schedules around the world. Many of us consider ourselves amateur detectives, eager to solve the mysteries of television crime shows and the evening news. But what would happen if we applied the skills of a cold case investigator to the claims of the New Testament? For 35 years, cold case homicide detective J. Warner Wallace rejected the New Testament claims about the resurrection of Jesus. But after applying skills he learned as an investigator, he eventually became skeptical of his atheistic skepticism. When he decided to apply his skills as a detective to the claims of the New Testament, he came to a startling realization. The case for Christianity was as convincing as any case he'd ever worked as a detective. Have you ever questioned the resurrection or know someone who has? Follow along with J. Warner Wallace as he examines the most important case in all of history. You'll learn how to think like a cold case detective and share the compelling evidence that Jesus truly is alive. We need to share the good news with those who desperately need to hear it. Will you become a case maker for Christ? Order a live in packages of 10 and begin sharing the most important message of all, the truth of the resurrection. do is we're going to talk about what's reasonable. We're going to move right to the resurrection, okay? Because I think Chris is right. We talked about the reasonable and the standard of proof being beyond a reasonable doubt, but how do we decide what is reasonable? And that's the thing we're going to address in this last session, and we'll look at the resurrection, okay? You guys have been really good, really patient, so I appreciate your patience going through all this evidence together. I want to start off with a story about a woman in our city who was a bank robber and a perennial drug addict. We get called out to her house one day. We've been there a thousand times for all kinds of drug-related calls. And she was dead in her bed. And when we got there, officers looked at this. This is her nightstand. And her nightstand is cluttered with all the paraphernalia she used to get high. She was a heroin addict who smoked rock cocaine. So she would cook her heroin in these cans, on the bottom of these cans, and inject the heroin with these needles. You can see the blood here from different injections she's done before. So there's a number of hypodermic needles here. One, two, I mean, there's a few of them. And whenever she smoked rock, you've got pipes, rock pipes here. She'd been a problem in our city for a number of years. And when officers got there, I mean, this is just an overdose waiting to happen, this lady. So they get there, and she's dead in the bed, and they called a, you know, basically called the coroner, and they just stood around there waiting to see the coroner's going to get there. They never even bothered to pull down the blanket because when they walked in to a known drug addict who appears to have overdosed, and that's what's on your nightstand? <laughs> okay. She finally kicked out. She finally overdosed. But when they pulled the blanket down, she'd been stabbed to death. So they were absolutely wrong about their presuppositions. They had a view of who she was. They had an expectation when they walked in the room. And if you have an expectation when you walk in the room, trust me, you'll find a way to view all the evidence through the lens of your expectation. This is called presuppositional bias. And we have to be careful when we walk into crime scenes that we don't view everything through the lens of our, our biases, right? What we think the case might be. Now, I say that because we're about to do something. We have to remove our bias. Because my whole sense of Scripture was, even if it's a reliable account about some aspects of history, look, I can find archaeological evidence to support, what, 18th, 17th century England and all the locations that are mentioned in Peter Pan. It doesn't make Peter Pan a real character. <laughs> Got it? So although I might be able to find some archaeological evidence to support the New Testament, it does not mean that the miracles are true. It could just be mythology set in a historical context. Really, I had to ask myself, what is stopping me from embracing anything miraculous in the text? Well, it was my presupposition about, as a philosophical naturalist, I just did not think anything supernatural could occur. So I want to look at this now through this lens and see if you now see what I see. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our crime scene again. Oh, this time I've stabbed Jimmy to death. <laughs> 
just to remind you of that process we used called abductive reasoning. Remember, two lists, evidence in the room, ways to explain it. And we said, okay, this is the best way to explain it. Now we're going to turn the corner and use this process of abductive reasoning at the empty tomb of Jesus. Because I think the same process we use, we could use here. We just have to have some evidence in the room and some ways to explain it. And then we'll see which of these ways to explain it is most reasonable. Make sense? So let's take a look at how we might do this. And I think that absolutely Chris was right. Paul does talk about this as a very important, the singular most important piece of evidence in the Christian worldview is the resurrection. Paul says, if we aren't telling you the truth about this, we have been lying to you. And worse than that, you bought the lie. You have put your trust in another life, your trust in the resurrection of yourself. In a false story, you're to be pitied if that's the case, because none of this is true. The resurrection is the key piece of evidence. So we're going to look at it and treat it that way. There's a biblical scholar who's going to become a friend of mine. He's really a great guy. His name is Gary Habermas. And Gary's written a book along with Mike Lycona called the, Re- uh, the Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. I like this book, and I'll tell you why. Because he reminds me of me. He's examining the case for the resurrection in the way that I did. Here's what he did. Gary went out and he polled and surveyed every biblical scholar who's ever written, 3,400, I think, Biblical scholars who have written about Jesus, all the way from the most conservative Bible-believing scholars, all the way down to the most liberal Bible-rejecting scholars, like a Bart Ehrman. And he made a short list of all the minimal facts about the resurrection that everyone agrees to, even if you don't believe in Jesus is God, you believe in these minimal facts about Jesus, the very bare minimum facts. Now, I can tell you as an atheist, he lists like 13. I rejected all of them except for three or four. As an atheist, I might have given you these three or four bare minimum facts about Jesus and the resurrection. So I'm going to list those as the evidence in the room. Then we're going to see if we can try to explain this evidence in the room. So here are the facts that I would have given you. I think I would have said, okay, Jesus is a real person. I'm not a Jesus mither. There are a lot of Jesus mythers who are out there right now, and if you look at that stuff, it's ridiculous. I mean, that's just, it, I mean, no serious scholar denies. Even Bart Ehrman will, will fight against those who deny that Jesus ever lived. And he's not a Christian, but he believes, you know, that's crazy to think he never even lived. So I would have given you that he lived and that he died on a cross and was buried, but so what? That does not mean he rose from the grave. I also would have given you that the tomb was empty. And here's why I say that, because if you want to go game over on this thing right away, get the body out, drag it around town, or get the original claimers to recant. That would be game over. And none of that didn't happen. So we have something we have to explain. And I, would, I probably wouldn't have said it quite this way. I would have said that the disciples said they saw a risen Christ. Whether they actually believed it or not, I don't know. But yeah, I agree, they did say something about Jesus, and what they said seemed to really change the kingdom, okay? It changed the Roman Empire, and they seemed to be on fire. I might have given you this fourth one, but for sure I would have, I would have said, okay, these three I'm in on, but this does not mean he really rose from the dead. None of this guarantees a resurrection. These are minimal facts that as an atheist I could accept. They mean nothing in terms of proving a case for the resurrection. Because I would have said there are ways to explain those minimal facts that are not the Christian explanation. In fact, I'll give you seven explanations on the wall here, only one of which is the Christian explanation. The bottom one will be the Christian explanation, but I think any of these might also make the case. The only question is, which of these makes the most sense? Which makes the most sense of these minimal facts? Here's the E-list for evidence. Here's the E-list for explanations. I think we need to look at some of these. The first one, for example... Maybe Jesus didn't really even die, and the disciples were wrong about this. Uh, A lot of Muslims believe this to be the case. There are a lot of atheists that say, hey, you know what? Your own scripture seems to speak against your belief that Jesus died. Think about it. Not many people in the first century died as, as, as a result of crucifixion in the short period of time that Jesus allegedly died. It took a little longer to die on a cross than that. And you know that's true because your Bible confirms it. Jesus is crucified alongside two thieves, right? But when the Roman guards come along to see if everyone's dead that night, 
when they get to Jesus and the two thieves, the two thieves are still alive. So why do you think Jesus is dead? They're still alive. Maybe they're all still alive. He suffered. He passed out. He was resuscitated, not resurrected. So maybe they were just wrong about his death. Well, I want to show you some hidden science in the Bible. I don't think this is the case. I think we can kind of make a case for the true death of Jesus by looking at some hidden science, okay? I'm going to give it to you from a cop perspective. Look at this piece of, of Scripture. I think this has always been an interesting piece of Scripture because Luke is going to write this, and this is kind of weird. When I first read this, didn't you also think of this and go, wow, this is kind of bizarre? Luke says that he was withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood. Really? Okay, we got some collective experience as humans in this room. How many of you have ever seen that? I'm sweating so hard, I'm now bleeding. I mean, come on. As a matter of fact, the early church fathers who first read this, the first believers who read this were going like, what in the world? They couldn't figure it out. They'd never seen that themselves. As a matter of fact, the people who first wrote about this were confused by it. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, folks, for example, saw this passage and they're thinking, man, oh man, is, is Luke speaking poetically in some way? Or maybe we should, if we talk about this, let's just leave that section out. Let's just be quiet about that. As a matter of fact, Tertullian, or I'm sorry, Justin Martyr, when Justin Martyr writes about this passage of Scripture, he skips over the blood part. He doesn't even want to address it. Why? Because no one can figure it out. If you're going to write a story about Jesus you want me to believe, why would you stick that in there? All this is confuse it. I mean, we know the first hearers were also confused because they tell you they're confused. Hmm, but we know now what this is. This is, not, this is actually a piece of hidden science that's in the Bible. Because this condition has now been documented, but it's very rare. What's it called? It's called this. Psychogenic hematidrosis. And where do we see it? If you go on the CDC, if you look at where you see this condition, Wikipedia, you're going to find that it's, we see it most often in people who are sentenced on death row. The vast, I think 70% of all studies of this condition are seen in death row inmates. So maybe Luke, he's a doctor, he's going, hey, dude, I'm going to write about hematidrosis. Because about 2,000 years from now, people are going to see that thing and go, this is legit. Because, <laughs> man, <laughs> they ain't going to get it for 2,000 years. But trust me, when they finally get it, they're going to go, wow. I don't think so. It could just be that it was seen, it was observed, and now it's recorded for us because it actually happened. There's another piece of hidden science, but I want to walk you toward the second piece in a few steps because Jesus had an unusual path to the cross. His personal narrative getting to the cross is different than others who were condemned to the cross. For example, you know he's being accused of claiming to be the Messiah. Not only that, of claiming as the Messiah to have some authority even over Caesar. Oh, don't say that. He's brought in front of the, the, the Jewish council. Here's what happens. He's being questioned, and he says to them, kind of getting himself ready for a beating here, I think, why do you question me? He questioned those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. When he had said that, one of the officers smacked him in the head. You don't talk to the high priest that way. And the beating begins right here. His path to the cross is full of torment that others don't, don't get because he made claims that others didn't make. What happens next? Well, it gets worse. They blindfold him. They start beating him with his fist. They slap him in the face. By the way, you'll see that every ancient, classic, Renaissance version of a painting about Jesus during this Passion Week, during this night of his trial, he's always in pristine condition. I don't care what kind of beating he takes, you won't see much blood on the classic Renaissance paintings. Jesus has given more respect than that. But I think it's deceptive for us because we have the tendency to underestimate what he endured because he's never painted that way. So it gets worse from this point. The next thing that happens, according to Scripture, is that they scourged him. Oh, that sounds like, oh, they scourged him. They scourged him. Do you know what that entailed? It entailed taking a whip called a flagrum that had pieces of rock or, or bone at the end like a cat of nine tails, 
and beating this guy to within an inch of his life because those parts were bad enough. This part's bad enough. This part's killer. They opened him up. But even when you go back for a second, look at the painting. Still looks pretty good, huh? You never see Jesus the way he really looked because you suffered from that flagrant. It would not have been pretty. It doesn't stop there. They get him back down in front of the, you know, it seems that Pilate doesn't even want to do this. He's kind of like saying to the people who want him executed, dude, I don't see anything wrong with this guy, okay? How about this? I don't think we can execute him. How about if I beat him to within an inch of his life? Go ahead and beat him. They beat him up, bring him back in front. Good enough? We done now? Are we done now? Okay, look at him now. He's a mess. Are we done? No. Execute him. Execute him. That's not enough. They want more. He's enduring a lot more than most endured getting to the cross. Now, basically, he's got a crown of thorns stuck on his head. They give him a reed like a staff. They start beating him with the reed. Then, by the time he actually gets to the point where he's... By the way, let's go back for a second. How's he look? Pretty good. By the time he's actually carrying his cross, unlike others, he can't... The Son of God cannot carry his cross. What's that about? He's already starting to show the signs, the hidden signs. We know what happens when people take a beating like this. They start to go into some form of shock, circulatory shock. He can't even carry his own cross. Then they actually execute him. And even in the most traditional versions of this, it doesn't look that bad. Now, I suspect that most of us are now familiar with what? The Passion of the Christ. Have you seen that movie? Was that a bit disturbing? Because finally, you got past the Renaissance paintings. And you got to see what Jesus probably looked like. And it's not pretty. But it's important for us to understand this. So now when we get to the second piece of hidden science, you'll recognize it. And it's here in the Gospel of John who's a fisherman, not a, not a doctor. He says, The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus. Why? Because it's getting close to sundown. We've got to get these bodies off the cross. You've got to be dead before I can take you off the cross. If you're on the cross and you're not dead, the way to get you dead is to break your legs so you can't push up anymore and take a breath. You'll suffocate on the cross with your legs broken. So the idea here is to go through and break the legs of all the people on the cross so to make sure they're dead. But when they get to Jesus, it says they didn't break his legs. They came and found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Really? If I'm writing this thing, this is a fictional account, I think I might imagine to put the blood in. But would you have put water in that also? Remember I told you how uh, the Sweating blood was confusing to the earliest believers. Oh, this is much worse. Everyone who writes about this cannot figure out what the water's from. And there's lots of early church fathers who write about this passage. And they try to figure out a way to contextualize it, to analogize it, to make it a metaphor, to figure out what that water means. Is it about baptism? Is it about the Holy Spirit? And if it's Tertullian or Origen or Jerome, anyone who writes on this passage... Because certainly it couldn't be real water came out of his body. It makes no sense. Why would water come out of his body? Hidden science. If you've ever seen a, been to a car accident where somebody has suffered blunt force trauma before they die, or a beating blunt force trauma before they die, they are going to go into circulatory shock. At the point of heart failure, you have something called effusion that occurs. Two forms of effusion. One is circulatory shock caused either pericardial effusion, which is where water collects in the sac around your heart. But most doctors who have studied this will tell you that this sac is very close to the heart. So if you were to poke it with a blade and come back out again, the water and blood would be so close to each other that you wouldn't even see a separation at all. But if you suffer from pleural effusion in your lungs, that would be different. Because now water is going to collect in the, in the lung. And if you're in a hanging position, it's going to collect in like a slower sac. If you stab that part of the chest cavity and pull out the, the blade, you're going to see a separation of water and, blo and blood. This would explain what he's seeing. Unless he's thinking like, Luke, you know, if I write this water thing into this, no one's going to get it for a few hundred years, but 2,000 years from now when they discover what plural effusion is, they're going to think, this is so, this is Jake. This is legitimate. Okay. Or he's just describing what he saw. Nobody gets it because nobody understands plural effusion until we get it. Now we've got a piece of hidden science in the scripture. That makes sense to me. Also, I want you to read this passage from the Gospels. Look how fast I read this, okay? They take down his body from the cross. 
By the way, do you realize that in our culture, if somebody, if your Aunt Mildred dies tomorrow in, your bed, in her bedroom, you're going to go over to her house, and I doubt you're going to pick up her body and carry it to the mortuary. You're just going to call the mortuary, and they're going to come and get your Aunt Mildred. Mildred. And if, if she dies suspiciously, you get there, you're not quite sure why she died. You know, she's only 50 years old. She's not suffering from any it's suspicious death. Well, then you're going to call the coroner. The coroner's going to come and handle your, your Aunt Mildred. In either case, few of us have ever had prolonged contact with dead bodies. When's the last time you moved a dead body around? When's the last time you really looked at a dead body other than in a box? We don't have that experience in the 21st century because we have services in place that handle that for us. But that wasn't the case in the first century. You buried your own. So everyone had contact with the dead, and they were very familiar with what the dead looked like. Now look at this passage. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in the tomb cut out of rock. Four things. Do you think it happened as fast as I just said it? I can say it in four seconds. But it didn't happen in four seconds. That took time to get the cross off, to get the nails out of his hands and feet, to get him wrapped. And there are three inconvenient truths about dead bodies that, trust me, if you pull one off a cross, you're going to see one of these three. I'll introduce them to you by way of the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. There it is. Nice old building. But in the basement where we do autopsies, it's a, kind of a house of horrors. If you're involved in a murder, if you get killed... I'm going to have to go, if I'm working the case, I'm going to have to go to the autopsy. Why? Because uh, coroners never want to testify in preliminary hearings. So I have to testify for the coroner in the preliminary hearing. <laughs> so I have to go and watch the autopsy so I can testify for the coroner. Make sense? So I go to all the autopsies of these dead people. There's no fun. This is an interesting building, though. It's an old, you know, kind of 1930s building, that structure there. And right here, when you walk in the door and you go right over here, that's the gift shop. Yeah, go online. Google it online. Los Angeles County Coroner's Gift Shop. You can get all kinds of cool stuff. You can get like, you know, aprons that have a body outline that says stay cool because, you know, they do, it's all like refrigerated bodies. You can get cutting boards, you know. We'll give you a hand. It says on there. No, I'm serious. They actually have this stuff at the coroner's office. It's pretty funny. I should bring a t-shirt when I do these talks. Anyway, but in the actual examination room, this is how they might look today, but back when I was doing this work a lot, they didn't have these nice, clean metal surfaces. There's a reason why these examination rooms have metal like this and why there's a grate right here. That grate is so you can hose down all the stuff that's on that table and get it into that grate. I just talked to somebody who was there last, last year. They still use wooden tables in Los Angeles. Think about that for a second. Right, you're cutting up bodies on wooden tables. This room is horrific. It smells so bad. It's like a big bloody house of horrors. You never hear constant. It's, it's a factory of dead bodies that die in Los Angeles County. And if you've been dead for six days and you're all bloated and stinky, you still get an autopsy. I used to go in there sometimes if the guy next to me was a big swollen up bloated guy. I was like, oh, please, please, can we hurry this up? Because I don't want him to cut into that guy before we get done. Because that's not going to be any fun. And I can tell you, this is a nasty mess. There's actually a sign on the back wall here that says, no eating in the examination room. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like we're going to eat in the examination room. But there are three things, that three inconvenient truths that happen at death. It's called the mortis triad. And I can't imagine you could ever try to get Jesus' body off that cross without noticing these things. The first thing you see is that people, when they die and their heart stops pumping, and that heart is pumping warm blood, the first thing they do is they cool down. And they get cold to the touch. If you think that dead bodies look like unconscious bodies in the movies, when they're dead, there's something different about a dead body. It's not like a sleeping body. It's very different. You, as soon as you walk in, you know, that guy's not sleeping. That guy's dead. <laughs> and, and so you see this, the cooling is the first thing, though, to the touch. Because now you don't have that hot gyroscope pumping blood through your body. Because that heart is not pumping body, uh, blood. That's called algor mortis, by the way. You also have the body start to get stiff. That's called rigor mortis. So it's part of this mortis triad. They get stiff. You hang on that cross. If I don't get you down, you're going to come off the cross and your arms are going to come down very slowly because you're in that stiff position. That's where you started. You've got to push those arms down. The last thing you do is you have bruising. 
because the blood is not continuing to pump through your body. So gravity is going to pull the, 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 the unpumping, the unmoving blood, uncirculating blood. It's going to pull it to the lowest extremity. If you die on your back and I get there and I roll you over, your back's going to be black and purple. Your front will be pretty white because all the blood is now, gravity is taking it to the lowest point. And that is called liver mortis, mortis triad. The reason why we don't think about this is because we don't have daily contact with dead bodies as part of our culture, but the first century did. To say that you think they could get this body and they were fooled, ah, he was just passed out. Really? Okay, it's possible. It's just not reasonable. By the way, that's the whole determining factor here, separating what's possible from what's reasonable. Anything's possible. So isn't it possible he didn't die? Absolutely. It's just not reasonable. And I don't care what's possible. I only care about what's reasonable. Well, maybe it's a different issue. Maybe they're just lying about this. They're conspiring. Well, that comes down to why they would lie. We've already talked about that. But this is a, a, often argued as one of, this whole thing is an elaborate lie. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. That means we're talking about conspiracy theory. I can help you with conspiracy theory because I have to work these all the time. Anytime two or more people commit a, a murder, they're involved in a conspiracy. It's an additional charge in California. Probably an additional charge here in Indiana. You add that additional charge. Now, I can tell you that conspiracies require five things to work. I know because I work these. If you have these five things, you can actually pull off a conspiracy. Without these five things, it's very difficult. And for those of you who are in this room right now who love conspiracy theories, stop it. <laughs> okay, it's stupid. If you want to be seen as a rational thinking person and you think that some large segment of the U.S. government is involved in a 50-year-old conspiracy, please, these five things are necessary for a conspiracy. The first thing you need is the lowest possible number of conspirators. It's much easier for two people to lie than it is for 25 people to lie and hold the lie. You also need the shortest possible time span in which to hold the conspiracy. It's easier to hold a conspiracy for 10 minutes than it is for 10 years, right? Does that make sense? You need excellent communication between co-conspirators. You need to make sure that I know if I stop this guy and he gets asked, does he have our story together? What'd you tell him? I need to repeat to my guy what you told your guy to hold the conspiracy. You can't pre-plan everything in advance. You just can't. If I'm going to interview people, I always get into the weeds, the minutia of their story, because I know they planned this much, but I want to know what's going on down here, because I know they didn't pre-plan this. This is where they're going to have problems matching their story. Make sense? The next thing you need, if you can get it, is if you've got a strong family relationship between co-conspirators, it's hard to break those because, you know, a mom is not even going to waive her rights to speak to you about her son. That's your baby. By the way, the son will rat off the mom, but the mom won't rat off the son. And the last thing you really need, if you think about it, and this makes sense, don't you think, is you need some pressure. If you don't apply pressure to people who have done a conspiracy, why would they give it up? I mean, you've got to apply some kind of pressure. Let me show you how this works in a real case. I got called out maybe three or four years ago, two, two years ago maybe, uh, a case where two guys were involved in a murder. When I got there at the scene, I don't handle fresh murders. I'm a cold case guy. But when I get, they call me out because I'm the oldest guy on the team. So I get out there, and I'm looking at this thing just as an advisor, basically. And the guy who's assigned the case says, dude, look at this mess. I said, yeah, I'm looking for two guys at least. One guy couldn't do this. Do you have an idea who the first guy is? And he said, I think so. Do you want me to go out and arrest him? I said, no. <laughs> you think he's going to just tell you who he did it with? We have a surveillance team. I worked on that team. Let's put our surveillance team on that guy. If you think you know who he is, we'll watch him for a few days. But here are my rules. When you watch him, stay with him the whole time. See who he's hanging out with. That may be your co-conspirator. But do not... Do not, when we take him to jail four days from now, do not let him know he was being watched by our surveillance team. Bring a black and white with you. Uh, if you've got some other reason to take him to jail, give him some pretense, take him to jail. Let the black and white come in and take him to jail. Do not let him see your surveillance cars. If you think you're going to take a burn, get out. Take him to jail right away with the, with the uh, black and white. Don't let him see you were following him. Cool, we can do that. They go out that night, they find him. He's driving around in the victim's car with one other guy. Probably the right guy, I think. We gotta, this is good so far. We're in the victim's car. We got a co-conspirator. We're good to go. 
They follow him for four days. They does all kind. They buy dope. They go out. They spend some money. They 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 actually sell the car to a bunch of gangsters in the valley. And so they made to split the team. One team stays with the car. One team stays with these two bad guys. And we're you know, it's a big 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 hassle. But at the end of it all, we finally take him to jail. Four or five days later, we get him into custody. Now I know. Here's how you have a successful conspiracy. And they've got some things in their advantage. They've only got two people involved. That's as small a conspiracy as you can get. They've only had to hold it for four or five days. That's not bad. They aren't related to each other, so this is in my favor. They're just two friends. So I know I can control, I can't control these two things. That's already, that's done. But I can control these three things. This is not necessary. I gotta control communication and pressure. So I separate these two guys. I take my time getting there. I wait a couple of hours. I go into the first room with the first guy, and I say, dude, I've been talking to your buddy for the last two hours. I hadn't been, but I told him I was. And this guy does not want to go to jail for what he says you did. He's willing to lay you out. And he told me everything you did for the last four days. Let me, let me tell you what you did for the last four days. And I tell him everything they did for the last four days as if his partner told me, when in fact I actually watched it with our surveillance team. He couldn't believe his partner would rat him out that quickly. He was upset. And he gave me about 10%, 20% more. So what do you think I'm going to do next? Go to the other guy. Dude, I've been with your partner for the last four hours. He does not want to go to jail for what he says you did. And he's told me he's willing to work with me. He's given me all the information about you. And I give him everything we watched him do plus the 20%. How many times do you think I need to go back and forth? Three times. Both of them copped out completely. They're both serving life in jail. No, no, no parole. They were 19 when they did this. Very young. But I knew I had to control some things. I had to control the communication. They can't talk to each other to see what... They had no idea what I was doing. And they couldn't talk to each other. And I had to put pressure on them. So they thought that they were going to be the only one to go. Make sense? So once you know the five things that are required for a conspiracy, now you know how to break conspiracies. And this is what we do when we work conspiracy theories. Make sense? Okay, now I want you to turn a corner. Instead of these five guys or these four guys I have on the wall, I want you to imagine now the conspiracy that the 12 would have to pull off in order to get the Christian conspiracy to work. Given the five things that are required, let's play a game of Clue. Put the Clue board up. And instead of having your usual Clue board, we'll go ahead and use the area around where Jesus had his ministry. There it is. Put the game pieces on, the Beely Disciples. Put a couple cards down. The first thing we've got to ask ourselves is, okay, how long do these guys have to hold this conspiracy? Uh, how about 60 years? Really? <laughs> really? Okay, stop. All you, you know, uh, JFK conspirators, all that stuff, just stop. I mean, do you think it wouldn't be a payday for somebody by now to tell the truth about some of these things? A cultural payday, a book deal, a movie, protection, all the stuff you want. You'd be a cultural hero. No, that's not, that's not good. How about this one? Do they have a way to communicate with each other? Well, they're not in this holy huddle. They're all over the, the, the map. So do you really think that Thomas knows in, North, in uh, India what Matthew is talking about in North Africa? You don't think this guy who's interrogating Thomas and beating the dog's not out of him is going to say to him, dude, your partner's already gave this up. Tell me the truth. Why would you want to die alone for this lie? Everyone's getting that routine done to them. They're getting beat to death. As a matter of fact, the kind of pressure that's being applied, let's take a look at that. That's a whole other thing. I love Clue. Don't you love Clue? They're getting Jack Bauer pressure, Okay. <laughs> And then they're just getting beat to death. Terrible pressure, no communication, separated by thousands of miles for 60 years. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's possible. I don't think it's a reasonable... I, don't, I really don't think this is a reasonable... Is there, now, there were some brother relationships. But how is Matthew related to any of these guys? He's not. Why does he care what's happening to this guy? Forget it. Who in their right mind is willing to die for nothing they know is a lie when their partners are being told they're going to get off for it. Okay, it's possible because anything's possible, but I just think it's ridiculous. It's not reasonable. That's not a reasonable scenario. And of course, we already talked about motive, right? How motive is by those three things we talked about. And these folks never gave up their testimony. They didn't get rich off of it. They didn't get a lot of girlfriends off of it. And they didn't get really, they couldn't even control the way they died. 
I think it's, you know, also, if you're going to tell this story and you're going to lie about it, do you really think you're going to make the first observers of the risen Jesus women? It's Mary who sees Jesus first. You think you're going to believe a woman in the first century on this? Very, if you're making fiction out of this, the first person who should see Jesus should be either Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus. Two people who had juice in the culture who people might actually believe. Instead, you're going to say that women saw it? That's just a not, not a good way to go. Now, by the way, women could testify in trials. Don't this idea that women had no... No, they did have... They would testify in hearings. But they, it, honestly, they were not considered as reliable as men. But that's who actually saw him. So you just write it out the way it actually occurred. I think this idea that they're lying is certainly possible. It's just not reasonable. You're going to get tired of hearing that. Maybe they just saw this as a vision, you know, a hallucination. They wanted Jesus to be alive so badly. Look at Mary sees a gardener. And she says, oh, it's Jesus. It's, it's a, maybe it is a gardener. Maybe she just wanted to see Jesus so bad she imagined the gardener was Jesus. Couldn't that, I mean, that actually seems like it might be reasonable. I mean, think about the first sightings of Jesus. It's Mary. In these two accounts, she's by herself. And she wanted him to be alive. Maybe she imagined it. Or Peter. Peter sees him. In these two accounts, he's by himself. Peter certainly wanted Jesus to be alive. He made a lot of mistakes with Jesus. He wanted to, I'm sure, make amends for those. It gets a little dicier, though, with people like James. James, you know, we have an account here in 1 Corinthians where he sees him by himself, allegedly. But, you know, I don't, did you think that James really wanted Jesus, his brother, to be? Maybe. He's his family. Okay, so maybe he wanted Jesus to be alive, too, so that's why. He's by himself. But then how about, like, this guy, Paul? Nobody else on the road to Damascus actually sees this vision except for Paul. But do you think Paul really wanted Jesus to be alive? It gets harder, I think, to explain here. And then you have problems with every other sighting that involves multiple eyewitnesses who see the same thing. Because let's face it, like the people on the road to Emmaus, these disciples, there's more than one person involved in this sighting. So if, if you told me, hey, uh, I told you last night I had a dream, and in this dream I was driving down Melrose Avenue in a, in a, uh, a, a new uh, Viper, and you said red, right? I'm like, mm, yeah. And you were listening to the radio. I said, well, yeah, how'd you know that? And you were listening to Ed Sheeran, right? I said, I was starting to freak me out, okay, because I'll tell you something. If you have the same recollection that I have, that's not, no one has group dreams, okay? That's called a memory of something that actually occurred. This is what we have here. We have a number of sightings in which we have more than one person saying the same thing they experienced at the same time. So what do we have here? Group hallucinations? You have the, the, the actual woman at the tomb. There's more than one. And then you have like sightings of the, of the smaller group sightings, like when the disciples are at the sea and they see him at the seashore and they run to him. I couldn't get them all in this picture, so I had to go a couple off screen there. Sorry. Or you have the disciples who were there without Thomas. Well, you had Judas was already gone, so you only had 11 minus Thomas. You got 10 here. 10 who saw all this at the same time. And then, of course, when Thomas gets back in the game, he joins the group, and now you have the disciples plus Thomas, so you have 11. And you have a couple of sightings like this. Not just here. You have the, the mountaintop sighting, where you have 11 who see him here at the mountaintop in Matthew 28. This is kind of a clever one I have for you here. How about the ascension of Jesus? Woohoo! hoo You see his little feet up there, and there he goes. <laughs> Got a bunch of people here at the same time. And then you have, in 1 Corinthians, you have Paul who says, dude, if you don't believe me, there are 500 people who saw Jesus arrive, uh, alive at the same time. You can go ask them. So I try to give you a, a comprehensive list here. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't get 500, so I added a few extra. There we go. Now we're good to go. Okay. <laughs> So how do you explain these kinds of, of, of sightings? It gets a little harder, I think. Also, if you wanted to falsify this, oh, you think you saw Jesus? Let's run back to the tomb and see if his body's in the tomb. But you get back to the tomb and the body's missing on top of it all. Now, that's different. Did somebody steal the body? If they stole it, now we're back to conspiracy theory. A lot of these theories roll back downhill to conspiracy theory because you have to account for the empty tomb. The one thing we all agree existed, even though in that minimal facts that Gary Habermas, the empty tomb is one of those minimal facts. So I think in the end, this is why Peter says, hey, we're not making this stuff up. We actually saw it with our own eyes. It's possible that they were mistaken, or, but it's just not reasonable. And all that matters is what's reasonable. Tired of hearing that yet? Okay, good. Maybe they were fooled. Maybe somebody was an imposter who said, hey, you know what? We can trick these guys and start a world religion. 
Do you know who this guy is here? If you work in a, forward or a fraud or a forgery in our city, eventually you might end up on the homicide team because you learn a lot, do a lot of search warrants. We have a lot of guys on our team that used to be fraud, uh, fraud or forgery guys. This guy's a con artist. Probably the most famous con artist of all. His name is Charles Ponzi. He started what's known as a Ponzi scheme. The chief rule I've learned from guys who work fraud who work con artists, is this. If you want to be successful conning somebody, you have to know more about the thing you're trying to con them about than they do. You might entice me to join your stupid business plan if I don't know much about business plans. You've got to fool me. That means that in order to con the 12, I have to know more about Jesus than the 12. Because I gotta, this is the group I'm trying to fool. Now think about that for a second. Who, who would know more than the 12? It had to be somebody from the inner circle, and he'd need help. Why? Because he's got to get that tomb empty. We're back to a conspiracy theory. But here's the problem with any imposter. Remember the risen Jesus after the, the, the uh, resurrection and the crucifixion is every bit as supernatural as the pre-crucified Jesus. The risen Jesus does all the same stuff that the Jesus did before. So if you're going to be a con artist, you've got to be good because you've got to be able to work miracles because you're going to see those. You've got to be able to do like appear, appear miraculously in the, in the room, pop in the room. And then you've got to be able to do that thing with the pulley and the, and the, and the rope, you know, where you've got to ascend into heaven. You've got to be good, like Las Vegas good, okay? Because everything after the resurrection is every bit as miraculous as before the resurrection. Okay, it's, you know, is it possible? Sure, it's po anything's possible. I just don't think it's reasonable. Maybe they were just influenced by, this is a more recent theory that I think Bart actually holds, that maybe one of them who deeply wanted to see Jesus alive had a spiritual vision of Jesus and then was so influential that he convinced the others it actually happened. Okay. Well, who would that guy be? Who could be so influential they would have? Well, we know who the first observers of Jesus were. They were Mary. Do you think Mary has influence to convince the others that Jesus actually appeared? She couldn't even convince Peter he appeared, remember? Peter, I just saw Jesus. Get out of the way. Let's go see what she saw. They don't believe her. I don't think she could do it. For a number of reasons, I don't think Mary could influence the others. And by the way, all the other group are group hallucinations. Is she going to encourage them to have group hallucinations? I mean, think about it. Work it through. Maybe it's not Mary. Maybe it's somebody like Peter. Peter was definitely engaged in this and, you know, loved Jesus, and he was influential. But the problem with Peter, if you think about it, is he's not the first person who had a vision. Is he going to go back to Mary and say, hey, Mary, guess what? I saw Jesus today, and you saw him yesterday. A little Jedi mind trick on Mary. <laughs> no, come on. I mean, this is, that's, not, that's not reasonable. Maybe it's Paul. Paul definitely had, you know, uh, influence. But did he really have influence with the 12? That's the question. Here's what I want to do. Imagine a, an imaginary vision. I'm, I'm Peter. Here's Peter sitting right here. And I'm going to have an imaginary vision of Jesus. And I love Jesus, and I really want to see him alive. So if you were to ask G Peter about this imaginary vision after the fact... Peter, describe for me what you saw. I guarantee you his description would be vivid and detailed because he's the source. Got it? Detailed, vivid description. Now, if he tells his vision to the others, and now I go to the others and I say, hey, what about that vision? What about that when Jesus appeared? Tell me about it. Well, their description won't be anywhere near as detailed as Peter's because Peter's the source of the vision. <laughs> They're the secondary source of the vision. The problem I have is that every account we see in Scripture is from multiple sources with extensive detail. This might be a lie, but to think that this is just a transferred vision from Peter or anybody else of influence doesn't make any sense to me. And by the way, if you wanted to falsify Peter's vision, what would you do? You would run back to the tomb. And if you run back to the tomb and the tomb is empty, you don't have an imaginary vision problem, you've got a conspiracy theory again because someone's got to get the body out of the tomb to make the story work. Again, everything rolls back to the empty tomb. I don't think this is a reasonable explanation. Possible, just not reasonable. This next part's fast, because we've already done all the hard work. Maybe these were just legends distorted over time. We talked about that, right? 
but we have good reason to believe they're not legends distorted over time because of all the work we did in the last session. We know they're early accounts, and we know they've been attested repeatedly by the chain of custody. So the idea that they're somehow distorted over time doesn't work if you do the work. Make sense? So now we're back down through all of these. We've now gone through six explanations. I don't even think we could say that last one's even possible. The idea that they're distorted over time is just evidentially impossible. We know what the evidence shows over time. That one is, but I'll just give it to you. Okay, it's possible. That's just not reasonable. So let's go to the last one. Turns out these are the ones that atheists, me as an atheist, I would have offered one of these six. This is the one that you Christians want right here. They're just telling the truth about the resurrection. It's pretty simple. And by the way, this really does a good job of covering all the evidence in the room. This would make sense of all this evidence. This is the one that actually explains the evidence best. But I'm here to tell you that every single explanation on that, ball, on that wall has virtues and liabilities, like they always do. Every case I've ever worked, my prosecution case with the suspect, which I know he's our, our guy, it has strengths and it has weaknesses. Every case I've ever done in front of a jury has a weakness. This, these have weaknesses. We've already talked about all the weaknesses. But don't think for a second that your version as a Christian does not have a weakness. It's got a liability that's so large it kept me out as, as an atheist. Because the Christian explanation requires something I would have rejected outright. The Christian explanation requires a resurrection. And for me, as a philosophical naturalist, ain't no way we're going there. That's out. Makes no sense at all. Because my presuppositions as a philosophical naturalist would never have allowed me to go there. But I want you to think about what this whole investigation is. Anyone who's examining the resurrection, what are they trying to look at? They're trying to look at whether or not really God could do such a thing. They're examining whether or not a resurrection is reasonable or possible. They're trying to figure out whether or not a resurrection could ever occur. Well, if that's your question and that's the investigation you're starting, you cannot start with the presupposition that no resurrection could ever occur. Right? That's the thing you're trying to investigate. And I tell you, a lot of my friends and me too, I would have said, okay, look, show me some evidence. Oh, well, you know, these are early dating. They are dated really early. I don't care. Resurrections don't occur. Jump over that. Well, I can show you some other evidence here. You know, for example, they're quoted by non-Christian authors in the first century, all kinds of other, don't care. Resurrections don't occur. I'm committed to that presupposition. <laughs> Resurrections don't occur. Well, we've got other evidence here. I can show you all kinds of historical. I don't care what you show me. I don't care how much you show me. If I'm committed up front that resurrections don't occur, I will find a way to get around those pieces of evidence because I know whatever it might appear to be can't be what you think it is because resurrections don't occur. You see what the problem is? Is that if I, I'm always gonna end up with this conclusion because I refuse to give up where I started. I began with that conclusion. And if you begin with a conclusion, you're, you'll find a way to get there. That's called what? That's called circular reasoning, where I end up where I began because I refused to get off first base. Make sense? Remember I showed you this picture? This is the presupposition the officers had. They came in believing in advance this is an overdose. And so therefore, they found ways to look at this as evidence to support their presupposition. But it didn't end up being that way. So when we're looking at the issue of the resurrection, there's only one of two possibilities. Here they are. Question, what happened to Jesus? Well, he either rose from the dead or he didn't. Okay, pretty simple. Now, if I'm willing to consider all possibilities, including those that might be supernatural and as an explanation, that one might lead me to this, this conclusion. But here's the problem. I reject anything supernatural. That is a blockade. It stands in my way. I cannot get to this conclusion because I have this barricade, supernaturalism. Mm -mm 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 -mm. On the other hand, if I just consider the natural explanations that we talked about to begin with, I have all these six problematic barricades. But I'll tell you what, 
I'm willing to find a way to jump over, get around, do whatever I have to do to twist and turn to get around all these problem explanations to get to this. This is a much harder conclusion to get to, but I'm committed to do whatever it takes to twist and turn and do what I have to do to jump over to get to that conclusion. Really? On this path, there's only one problem, one barricade. And guess what, folks? I'm the reason why it's there. I put that barricade there. That barricade is my presupposition. These problems are just the natural problems that come along with those explanations. This problem I created. Turns out I could actually remove that by simply not holding the presupposition. And if I do that, this road is clear. And the explanation makes sense of the evidence. The thing in my way is me. Got it? And for a lot of our friends who reject supernaturalism, I understand it. I get it. They're not even open to that. Okay. I just make the case. Because it turns out that God's in charge of that thing. You pray yourself through this. Your friends who you've explained it all and they seem to be going nowhere, you talk to God about those people. You do your part, God does his role. His role is foundational. I sometimes think what happens is we think as evangelists, as Christians sharing our faith, we think that we are like playing a game of tennis. We're on the clay courts, Wimbledon, the camera's rolling, it's hot, we're sweating, every point matters. We hit it back over, oh, it's out of bounds, oh, I lost that point, it's all on me, it's my fault. That is not what we're doing. This is not a game of tennis. This is a game of baseball. Your job is to get to the plate and do whatever you can to advance the runner to first. And you know what? When you get done, he may only be sitting on first. And then somebody else five years from now will come along and might get that guy to second. And I know this with Mormon. My Mormon family, this is very true. And then along the way, somebody else comes along and gets that guy to third. And then two years later, somebody else says something that God's moving in this guy's life and suddenly he's running home. And that guy who shared in that last moment goes, woohoo, I just brought somebody to Christ. No, you didn't. That guy was on third base leaning in. Dude, come on. You just did a little part of this because we're a team. So I want to encourage you, when you're sharing what you believe, this is not a game of tennis. And you might get done and think, I didn't accomplish anything. Because it doesn't appear you got a run in. Look, when I'm interviewing a suspect, I don't, I'm not trying to get home runs. I'm trying to get singles. I don't need him to confess I need him to lie to me repeatedly so I can demonstrate to the jury he's a liar. That'll work for me. <laughs> Enough singles, I'll drive in a run. We need to work as though we're just making singles. You are faithful and obedient to God when you get your butt up off the bench and get in the batter's box. That's it. If you make contact, great. You get a single, great. You don't make it, that's okay. You got off the bench, you did something. You do that, you're faithful. God credits that to your account. You get Good job, my faithful servant. You got off your butt for once and you tried. The rest, God takes care of this stuff, but he does allow us to play the game. Isn't that wild? So I want you to be encouraged. You may not see the movement you're looking for, but you are moving people. You just don't know it yet. Okay, I think in the end, it's all about the barricades that we put in place. And you see that the disciples, the authors of Scripture, are really good about describing who they are. When describing who they are, they'll say things like this. I spoke to the eyewitnesses. The people who are the sources of this information were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, Luke, said. Luke says. That's who Luke's interviewing. And Peter says, hey, we didn't follow a clever devised tales. We were eyewitnesses. And John says, guys, we actually were there from the beginning. We, we heard him. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. These are eyewitnesses who gave us an evidential trail. Last thing that we're going to call it a night. By the way, if you want follow-up materials, don't put this in your Google because you won't find it. It's in your browser, your internet browser. Put in coldcasechristianity.com forward slash resources. Oh, a lot of information, huh? A lot of information. I just want to encourage you, though, as you kind of move through and share your faith with your friends. It's not a race. Don't need to master it. Understand their presuppositions. Be faithful servants. Play the game of baseball. That's what we're doing. We're just making sure we play our role.
And when you get to the end here and you see the power of the gospel and you see your friends change their lives for what, look, I don't want to be an arguer. I'm not a case maker so I can win an argument. I want to be a case maker so I can pull down the barriers that stand between you and the gospel. Because it's the gospel that has the power to, sh- to change everything. But sometimes we build a wall around the gospel. What we're doing here is developing the tools to bring down that wall brick by brick. In the end, what's important is the gospel. Make sense? And I know you're in a good church that's going to teach you how to share the gospel. So I want to encourage you to do one last thing. If you look, I know you sometimes feel probably bad that you're not an evangelist like Billy Graham, that you're not really doing what you should be doing. But, you know, you may not be gifted in certain areas. It doesn't get you off the hook. Don't get me wrong. But look at what it says in Ephesians 4. Paul says some of you are pastors, some of you are teachers, some of you are evangelists. Well, doesn't that mean then that some of you aren't those things? And some of you may not consider yourself to be an evangelist. And in that sense, you may not have that office of an evangelist. But Peter in 1 Peter 3 says, some of you should be ready to make a case for what you believe. No. He says, all of you should be ready to give a reason for the hope you have in Jesus. So you may not consider yourself to be an evangelist, but you don't get out of this obligation to be a case maker. If you are a Christian, you are a case maker, according to Peter, because all of you have that responsibility. These are not separate, two, two separate things. So if you are in this room tonight because you came here tonight to see the case and you're not quite sure and you're thinking to yourself, is there really enough reason? Ask yourself, is it about there not being enough evidence to believe this is true? Or is it about you not wanting there to be enough evidence to make this true? There's a difference between these two things. But if you're here as a believer to learn all this stuff, I want to challenge you. The first decision you made was for Christ. The second decision needs to be to become a case maker. Make a decision to defend what you believe. Turns out it's easy to call yourself a Christian, isn't it? But it's hard to defend what you believe. I want you to do hard things. Because this life is not an easy life being a Christian. So I hope this has helped to prepare you. Now let's pray. Father, we just thank you for opportunities. Opportunities to just um, take the time necessary to walk through the evidence We know, we know that you have challenged us and we know that you have great respect for evidence. Jesus, we know that when challenged, you said, you know, um, if you don't believe what I'm telling you, believe the evidence of these miracles. And we know, Jesus, that when John's disciples came to you and said, hey, you know, John sent us and he wants to know, are you the one? That you didn't scold them like you're not gonna scold us. And instead, you performed miracles in front of them and then said, go tell John what you just saw. So, Father, give us the same healthy respect for evidence so we can make a case on the basis of what you've already shown us so we can make the case for you in this culture. We love you, Father, and we give you our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone here says? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for having me this weekend. I appreciate it. Good, man. Thank you.